So we're here tonight to hear from Morris Gleitzman, who presumably needs no introduction to you all, but I will give him a short introduction. Um, just quickly say that generations of children have grown up on his books. He's written over 30 books, which have been published in more than 20 countries. And his award-winning stories explore serious and sometimes confronting subjects in humorous and unexpected ways. His titles include Two Weeks with the Queen, Grace, Doubting Thomas, Bumface, Give Peas a Chance, Extra Time, Loyal Creatures, and the series Once, Then, Now, After, and Soon, which we're, of course, here to discuss tonight. So welcome, Morris. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start at the start. It's a good place to start. These are, of course, incredibly wonderful, profoundly moving um, books and at numerous times in my reading moved me to tears. And, and I wonder how you, how you came up with the character of Felix and how you came up with these stories. Great. That's the one question that will carry us through the next hour. Excellent. <laughs> That's, no, it's a very efficient way to conduct an interview and I applaud it. Um, Felix really came to me, like all my characters, um, I found him one day, or some early vestiges of him, some of his feelings in my imagination. Um, and in those very early days, this was about 15 years ago, he wasn't in any way a war child. I was mm -hmm. planning to write a story about friendship. I met thousands of young people over many years as part of my job and, and often had conversations with them or heard from them about their friendships and how important friendship is, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, so I decided that many of the books about friendship written for young people that I'd come across were fairly, I thought, fairly safe, fairly easy, um, happy ending, feel good sort of stories. Nothing wrong with stories like that at all. But I was interested in exploring friendship's capacity to flourish in really tough times, to be an even more vital and necessary part of our lives. And so I decided simply to take a friendship between two young people and place it slap bang in the middle of some of the most unfriendly behavior I could connect with on the largest scale. And one could make, of course, an endless list of such instances of large scale mm. human unfriendliness around the world today and back through history. But I didn't even need to begin that list because I have a distant family connection mm. with those terrible years of the Holocaust that it was one that I had always wanted to explore more personally and this seemed the opportunity to do it through my writing as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess Felix has been with me on a journey of discovery for me about many aspects of those terrible times. And of course for him, once he assumed his place in the structure of the story, then it became a journey of discovery for him with far greater, I have to say, repercussions than, than for me in my physical or in my family history. So the Holocaust was um, an, an important, useful site for you because of that because of that family history or did you were there other reasons and I guess you also in one of the books also look at the bushfires and I wonder about the connection you saw between Holocaust and bushfires well um, the Holocaust I guess became um, the focus for these stories for a whole range of reasons um, certainly it was it, the entry point for me was was that it represented in general terms, the worst that we are capable of as a species. And, and in exploring and celebrating friendship, I, I wanted to explore the best yeah. that we were capable of. And to juxtapose the two seemed to throw up all sorts of interesting mm -hmm. considerations, particularly for young readers. Um, it, I also perhaps um, had a, a larger or a longer term desire, because this, this is something I've explored in other books, um, I, do, I do think it's important that stories for young people um, go to both ends of the spectrum in terms of what humans are capable of because mm. one of the things I think stories are capable of doing and for young people have a responsibility to do is to chart some of the territory that young people have ahead of them both 
in practical worldly terms and in emotional terms and in, in terms of what they're going to have to find within themselves mm. to make the best of their lives, personally and as members of a community, a future community, which, which will be running the world. And, um, and w they will inherit from us a world full of big problems and significant failures, as well as triumphs and inspirational moments. And for them to be fearful and to feel a desire to hide away from the nature of the world is really not going to do any of us or them or the world mm -hmm. any good. So, so I, I think one of the things that stories provide is, is an opportunity to experience in a real, deep, emotional sense a whole range of the sort of experiences that lie ahead for any citizen of the planet through their adult life. And that has to include the best and the worst. And so the Holocaust simply is the worst. The bushfire connection, which um, occurred in, in the third book in the order that I wrote them now, after the first two books, where Felix, as a 10-year-old in 1942, they cover most of his 10th year. They cover some huge, hugely affecting experiences for a 10-year-old boy. Many losses, many, most of the people dearest to him are lost. And towards the end of the second book, and I'm on a promise to my publishers to um, avoid all spoilers tonight, but um, <laughs> towards the end of the second book, there is an event in Felix's life involving the person who perhaps has become the most important to him at this stage that is probably the most painful and difficult experience of, of, of his life to date. And as I was moving towards writing that s section of the book, I couldn't stop thinking, or I thought increasingly, I wondered how it would affect Felix for the rest of his life. Mm. And so by the time I'd finished the second book, I decided to do something that even as I was doing it, struck me as perhaps a little foolhardy and certainly um, testing the patience of, of my faithful readers, which was in the third book to leap 70 years into Felix's future to rejoin him on his 80th birthday. Because not only would that allow me and readers to get a sense of the whole span of his life and how those childhood experiences had affected that life both for better and for worse, but also, um, I wanted to give Felix the opportunity late in his life to have a, an experience that I hoped would allow him to revisit through his memory and his emotions some of those terrible events of his childhood from a, a slightly new perspective, from the, pers from the perspective of somebody who's lived an extra 70 years, who's made some wonderful contributions to his community as a pediatric surgeon who's known love and loss as an adult as well as a child and what I needed in story terms was an event in contemporary Australia that would be a massive unstoppable relentless destructive force so huge and so so powerful um, and so relentless that it couldn't, he couldn't help but be taken back in his memory and his emotions to the last time he'd faced such a force, which in the 1940s was the, the awful Nazi genocide machine. Well, what in contemporary Australia, I asked myself, mm. could, could serve that purpose? And I was thinking about this for months. And there was one morning a few years ago, one Saturday morning, when I'd spent a couple of hours at my desk still trying to sort of think of what could happen. And it was an incredibly hot day in Melbourne, the hottest in memory, and there were terrible winds. Mm. And it had been said for several days that if a fire starts that day, that's going to be big trouble. And I switched off my computer at about midday to thinking, I, I, I just don't think I can write this book. I just don't think, um, I don't think anything. Um, I, uh, I can't think of anything that can, that can support what I need to happen in this third book. 
And when I switched over to the news on my computer, the first reports were coming through mm. about the terrible bushfire on that Saturday. And um, I'm ashamed really to, to say what I'm about to say, but I will because I know I'm among friends and we're in four <laughs> walls and it's a, it's a, you know, nothing will ever leak out from this room. So <laughs> even as that day progressed and we realized that those first reports, those first warnings to some of those small towns up to the northwest of Melbourne that they were in danger were hours too late and those towns had disappeared. Even when the magnitude of that terrible tragedy was becoming apparent mm -hmm. and I was feeling all the emotions that we were all feeling of pity and compassion and concern, there was a little corner of my mind that was saying, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. And so I used that bushfire or my version of it as, as, as much as anybody who wasn't in its path could use it. It was, I guess, similar to the way that somebody who wasn't personally involved in the Holocaust can even contemplate appro approaching it from the distance of time and safety to, to write about it. Mm. But it did, uh, it did become the metaphor I was looking for as well as mm. the practical experience. And I felt justified in making use so quickly mm. of something that had affected and damaged so many lives in Australia because for Felix, mm. it was what he needed. And it gave him the opportunity towards the end of that third book to, ha to have some insights and to start to approach some forgiveness of himself that he would never have been capable of as a 10-year-old boy. Mm. And I think, well, I felt he deserved that. So, mm. uh, so caught up was I in this desire to, to help my, my dear character and friend in this way that I'd momentarily forgotten that I was severely testing the patience of readers by asking them to jump 70 years into the future, or rather, not so much at that point, but when Felix came back to me a year or so later to let me know that that, um, that jump had actually carried the story over some very important parts of his young life and that there was more work for us to do and that I would have to go back, that's when I realised I was really going to be imposing a big ask on readers because... I don't know if literary whiplash is a, an official term, but, um, <laughs> but that 70 years in the future and 68 years back was, um, was quite a lot to ask. Mm. I, I mean, uh, you know, as the reader, I think it, just, it works so beautifully, I think, to, to show, I guess, the connections between the different traumas and to make, in a way, the Holocaust more accessible and more uh, approachable for, for the readers, potentially, to see that these things are not such distant matters, that they can happen at our doorsteps and to make those emotional journeys um, more connectable, potentially. And it's a really complex and difficult one and mm. I've, um, I, I know exactly what you're saying and I've, and I've agonised about this for years because at the very outset of this whole project for me, when I decided that it was the Holocaust that I wanted to appropriate, if, if, if you can say that, as, as as my, as the example of ultimate human unfriendliness, to also put it that way, in, in, in terms of, of, of friendship being at the heart of the story I wanted to write. Mm. I was aware from the very outset that it was famously said, and I can never remember if it was Primo Levi or, um, or somebody else um, who said, in the early 1950s, I think. And it was a statement directed at the, at the global community of writers. And it, and, and it was said, if, if you weren't there, don't write about it. And we understand, of course, why that was uttered up to a point. The irony, of course, is that if we weren't there, we can't understand 100%. And I agonised for a couple of years as to whether that edict um, should still hold. And I finally decided, after talking with large numbers of young people, thousands in Australia and Britain and elsewhere, 
about that time in human, our human history and what they knew of it and what they felt about it. And, and I just got a sense that unless the young people, unless young people happened to be members of a Jewish community or had, were in one of the rare schools that had studied that particular area of history, that there wasn't much knowledge about it. It was in danger almost of becoming forgotten or at the very least Hollywoodized because the few young people or those young people I'd spoken to who, who were aware of the events had, had seen it through, through quite um, mass, mass market entertainment forms. And I felt that, um, that um, Elie Wiesel or, or, or Primo Levi, I hoped would, would feel that 70, 65 years after they'd, they'd uttered that, that edict, that maybe times had changed a little, and that if one approached this, this huge and terrible time in our past with enough respect and enough acknowledgement that a story is only ever a story, that when a person is trying to imagine something that they haven't actually experienced themselves, it can never be more than that. But it can still be something. And what I hoped it would be would be a bridge to the huge number of real voices that exist in archives, on video, on pages, and still, of course, that exist in living people because there are Felixes who are still with us. You go to any Jewish Holocaust Center museum anywhere in the world and there are people there as guides and education officers who were Felixes, real Felixes. Um, and I thought that if the story, and because I have the privilege that if I write a book, large numbers of young people read it, then I thought that, um, that the opportunity such a story could provide for, for bridging young people from perhaps a merely Hollywood version of history to the chance to connect and to have a purely personal, unique response with the real voices. That, that, that really did make it worth doing. And, and that was the rationalization I used to go ahead and, and disregard the edict. I think, you know, that kind of raises these really important questions about the difficulties of how do we write about the Holocaust or any trauma and how do you make it accessible to children and how do you write it in a way that, that um, I guess, kids can engage with. And, and I found um, uh, on, some, on an interview with you that's on YouTube, there's a whole lot of kids have commented underneath it. I don't know if there's numerous comments, but... Um, now one I'm terrified. No. <laughs> Um, one girl uh, call, who called herself Mob Girl, she wrote, I've read once then and I'm reading after and after that I'm going to read now and I don't know why my mum lets me read them because I'm only 10 but they are so awesome. And then It's Kelly here responded, I'm 11 and trust me, you won't regret it, smiley face. So I guess I'm wondering, um, I found this comment so, so endearing and so lovely that these kids are really engaged by um, these books and, but they also see the difficulty in being young and, and approaching these stories. And I wonder how you negotiate what is age appropriate and what is, how do you tell these stories to children? Well, even before you start thinking about age appropriateness, when you're dealing with some of the really dismaying reminders of what our species is capable of, I think a fiction writer, and probably an historian too, has to bear in mind that reading is a process which allows the reader to turn away, to put the book down, even to close the book permanently. And, and to, so it's a balance always, because of course one doesn't want to trivialize, sanitize. Um, there, there have been um, fictions on the screen and in books mm -hmm. in recent years that have used the Holocaust as, as, as part of their context. And some feel that they have perhaps sought wider acceptance as, enter as, as entertainments by softening slightly aspects of mm. those terrible times. 
You don't have to read too many good histories of the Holocaust or parts of it to be unaware that, that, um, that it would be very easy to fill the pages of a, a story set against that terrible time with events and with details that would be close to unreadable mm. or that would take a huge effort and, and, and an act of determination. Um, so the balance is to be, to be true and to honour and to respect what mm. did happen and certainly not to shy away from the worst that we are capable of, all of us, mm. but to also respect that to, to a greater or lesser degree, reading is a voluntary act. Even when kids are told to read a book at school or the teacher is reading it out to them, mm. they don't have to listen, they don't have to stay open to it. So, so I want to respect the desire of young readers to connect with this material. So it's a balance. But I certainly don't want to sanitise and I certainly don't want to keep young readers in cotton balls. Mm. I don't subscribe to the notion that they are better off if we can pretend to them that the world doesn't have terrible aspects. And I, I expressed some of my thoughts about that before. Um, but all the time, it's, it's an uneasy balance. Mm. I don't think one can ever be sure that one's got it exactly right. Mm. Do you think that... Um this talk tonight is, is part of a series at the Will Centre about coming-of-age stories, and I wonder, do you think that we as readers come of age by reading stories like this? Oh, I thought this series was about authors coming of age, because <laughs> I was 60 also a couple of years ago, and I sort of finally <laughs> felt that I'd grown up. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. <laughs> Terrible misunderstanding. Okay. Um, I think it's... I think... Well, I think coming of age is a, you know, is a very long and drawn-out process, mm. um, and but one's childhood and adolescent reading is a really important part of it, absolutely. Um, and, and, and one of the joys and privileges of my job is that I do get to spend time with huge numbers of young people, mostly in schools and gatherings like this, and, um, and up to a certain age, at least, young readers are splendidly forthright and unselfconscious in letting you know exactly their thoughts and feelings. Um, and, and I do get a sense that... I mean, it's very age appropriateness is very hard because mm. um, any any of us who work with young people or, or have an experience of of groups of young people know that you can put a bunch of ten year olds or twelve or fourteen year olds in a room and there's not going to be any homogeneity at all in in mm. where they are at different stages of their life. It's a it's it, <coughs> it's a very individual process. I guess authors for young people have to hope and trust that most young readers in our society anyway, our community, have got adults available to them who can guide to a certain extent, hopefully not rigidly legislate, but be there. I think it's the post-reading services that adults provide that are much more important than the pre-reading gatekeeper services. Mm. The post-reading services involve being available to talk to perhaps to read the book yourself, mm. but, and I know for busy parents this is not always possible, but to be available to listen. Mm. Because if kids are reading the sort of things that they should be reading, almost every book is going to take them into new areas of thought and feeling, and it's natural to want to share that and to want to sort of check in with with those reliable arbiters that lucky kids have in their lives, the parents, teachers, librarians, who are the, the experienced ones, the ones who've been before them along these paths and, and who can say, well, yeah, um, it is like that or I know how you feel or tell me more how you feel. These, these conversations, I think, are as important as, as the reading act itself. Mm. Do you think, continuing on the theme of coming of age, was this a coming of age story for Felix, do you think? Um, well, in one sense, um, because every day could easily be his last, mm. um, it's, a, it's a sort of 
it's a keeping of age. I mean, he's, um, you know, every day that he wakes up and finds that he's still a 10-year-old is actually good for him because it means mm. he's still alive. But his growth through the stories mm. is many aspects of it are absolutely aspects of coming of age. Mm. Um, and part of why I leapt ahead those 70 years in the third book to see, to, to, to spend time with him as an 80-year-old was because I actually wanted to, 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 to see how he had come of age in mm. the ageing sense as well as yep. the, the growing into adulthood sense, yeah. One of the beautiful things about the book, the books is the, I guess, the emotional journey that you see him go on and um, there's the kinds of ways in which he makes these connections um, across generations and, and within generations and friendships and caring goes in all sorts of directions and one of the, um, in the earlier books, he, can't, you, he, have, he or you have this notion of good protection and then later on this idea of good caring. Um, and I wonder if you, I, I, in, I fear there might be people in the audience who haven't read the books and I wonder if you could sort of talk about that notion of good caring and the role it played. Well, Felix has a very important young friend in the first two books, Zelda. She's a Polish girl, she's not Jewish, but as she becomes very passionately connected to Felix, she starts to identify as Jewish because he's Jewish and so she wants to be as well. A wonderful and touching um, desire, but of course a terribly ironically dangerous one for her at that stage. And a lot of the terminology I've used that become touchstones, little verbal touchstones in Felix's life, actually come from the way she expresses things as a six-year-old. And good protection is a phrase that she uses at one point and, and, and it, 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 it seems to Felix to evoke some things that are very important in his life. So he, even as an adult, still uses it. What it is, is an example of, of, of something I felt was very important, something I, I, I owed to Felix. I knew that through these stories, he was going to witness and be affected in the deepest and most, um, and, and most real possible way by, by some of the worst behavior humans are capable of. And so it was very important to me that he also be the beneficiary of some of the very best behavior humans are capable of. And I also, it was very important to me that young readers, through their connection with and emotional empathy for and their care, caring um, for Felix, should also be the beneficiaries of some of the best that, that we're capable of. And, and through these, these books, there are a number of adults who sacrifice or are prepared to sacrifice everything to shelter and to give protection good protection and, and nurturing to children for whom they have no official societal responsibility. They're not related, they're not parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents. These are strangers who are taken in by adults. Well, the adult who does this most significantly in the second book is a Polish farmer, Genia, running her farm alone because her husband has been taken to Germany forced um, to go to Germany by the Nazis, and, and um, he's, he's become a laborer there, a slave laborer. And when she, and I'm not giving too much away because this happens right at the beginning of the second book then, when she um, rescues and offers um, protection and hiding to Felix and Zelda, she discovers that Felix is Jewish when she gives the two very grubby kids who've been sleeping rough in a forest, um, when she gives them a bath and discovers that Felix is circumcised. Um, and, and she has a moment, um, and Felix can see she's having a moment, and she acknowledges that she actually doesn't like Jewish people very much. Um, and then she's not, she's not alone in that, her rural Catholic Polish community these, she's of a generation that's grown up, as many generations did before, in an atmosphere of, of you know, officially sanctioned anti-Semitism. But she then says that there's a group of people that she dislikes far more than Jews, and that is people who are unkind to children, and hence she's chosen to do what she does. 
and she, and and one of the reasons that I wanted her as a character and I wanted to explore what she does is is not only well is because I discovered through research through reading that such people were making were taking a huge risk there was no rap on the knuckles for hiding Jewish fugitives it was death for you and your family if you were caught hiding Jews, death for the Jews as well, of course. And later in the war, when the Nazis decided to ratchet up the fear factor in trying to dissuade people in Poland and other countries from hiding Jews, if you were caught, you were not only shot yourself and all members of your immediate family, but your family name was noted, and the Nazis would go out into the surrounding district and shoot everybody else with that family name on the basis that large extended families often have currents of feuding and resentment. And this way, there'd be more informing going on because if you're a disgruntled uncle out on a distant farm and you get word of the fact that your lunatic relatives in the city are um, hiding Jews and that if they're um, discovered, um, they will be shot and so will you, well then you're more likely to go off to the Nazis and dob them in on the basis that I had nothing to do with this and I disapprove of it, so please, when you shoot them all, leave me out of it. They were very, very um, sophisticated users mm. of fear manipulation, the Nazis. Mm. But I wanted, I wanted, um, I wanted these, these acts of goodness to be really a forceful presence in these books. And if I, if, if they'd not existed in the history, then I'm not sure that I would have known how to write these books mm. because I couldn't really have justified writing them um, for young readers if only the dark, if only the worst mm. was present on the pages. I mean, yeah, I think that what's so interesting about the books and one of the things is, is that they're deeply horrifying, but there is also this kind of optimism that runs throughout them. and. And I guess what I one thing I found interesting with this uh, latest book, Soon, is that the optimism seems a bit more tempered. It seems Felix has gotten a bit older. He talks about he's now 13, and that means he's a bit more of an adult and he has more responsibility, but also he seems his optimism is lesser. Well, I, his optimism has taken a huge blow because, mm. firstly, Felix... Felix, mm. I knew he'd always be optimistic from my, my early getting to know him in my imagination because it's always been my policy because all my books are about the biggest problem in a young character's life at that time in their life. Many of them, of course, aren't as objectively huge um, as something like war and, and genocide. But for the characters, these are life and death matters through all my books, even the ones with much more uh, obviously comedic surfaces on at least an emotional level, there's, there, there's a huge amount at stake. So, so it's always been my policy to equip young protagonists as much as possible with credible personal resources. Credible to me, uh, I, I don't personally feel comfortable with my characters being able to sort of jump on a broomstick and play fantastic sport games, but, <laughs> but I don't have any, I don't have, have any disgruntlement with, um, <laughs> with any authors who do. Professional jealousy, yes, but not disgruntlement. <laughs> um, so for me, the credibility is largely in, in, in what we understand as the fairly real world. So optimism, which is, I think, an innate quality of, of, that all young people have, um, the ones tragically that end up not having it, it's that they've lost it for various reasons. And, mm. and so most of my young characters across the whole range of stories I've written are optimistic, but no character I've written was in need of or deserved that optimism more than Felix. So this is really how this latest book soon came about, because as I was writing the previous book, which takes Felix through the last year of the war, gives him an opportunity to have his first inkling that maybe medicine is the field for him. He's, he ends up um, living with some partisan resistance fighters in the forest and as fighters they often are in need of medical attention and the field surgeon um, needs an assistant and Felix suddenly finds himself the guy who's sort of 
got his thumb on arteries at, at crucial moments, and he's discovering that once he, did, once he overcomes the panic he feels at the sight of blood and guts and the feel of them, that actually what this whole process of healing is about takes on great significance for him um, because he's grown up in a world where most of the adult um, agendas seem to be directed towards breaking things. And his optimism is very well served by a sense that he can go into his future life, the life that will really begin once the war ends and the, war, and the world starts to return to what he's always believed it's capable of, which is a peaceful and happy place. Um, and his capacity to heal um, is, that's, that's the sort of contribution he wants to make to that safe and happy place. When I realized, as I read many accounts from historians of that last year of the war, and often those accounts continue on into the months after um, the war ends, and I didn't stop reading, I, I, I read about those months, and I suddenly realized that in Central Europe in particular, Felix was in for a shock because that, that day he's been looking forward to for several years, the day when the war ends, it's not going to be a magical transformation into a world of peace and friendliness. In fact, in Central Europe, while the Nazis were no longer to continue, n no longer able to continue their genocidal activities, there were plenty of other people who were left with a very strong desire and the means to kill um, selected groups. And that did continue. I, I grew up, um, I was born in England, and so I grew up with those famous photos from Trafalgar Square where the day that peace mm. broke out, just briefly, large numbers of English people behaved in a splendidly un-English way, <laughs> um, expressed emotion openly in the streets, shared, you know, <laughs> shared, shared their glasses of beer with complete strangers, hugged and kissed people that they hadn't been formally introduced to, the whole thing. <laughs> And that was part of a sense that things went very quickly back to normal. I mean, I grew up in an age of food rationing in London. Um, you know, I'd barely seen an orange before I was about eight, and orange juice was something that was made from orange powder in bottles. But you know, these were trivialities, really, compared to what mm. was being faced in Central Europe, where not only was that continent physically wrecked, but its social systems were wrecked. Its um, sense of a public morality was largely wrecked, and a lot of individuals were very, very deeply damaged, emotionally, psychologically, as well as, uh, as well as physically. So it was a very difficult time to um, to be a 12-year-old boy, a 13-year-old boy, as Felix is, mm -hmm. still without um, a proper family network, just his his loyal and generous friend Gabriel, an adult, to look after him. And I knew that, that it would be probably the biggest test of Felix's optimism. Mm. Because it's how it is, isn't it? We, we, we grit our teeth and hang in, knowing that something is going to be over. And when we think it's over, and we give the big sigh of relief, and then we find it's not over, that can be the mm. biggest challenge of all. And that's, mm. that's the starting point for this book. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, one of the other threads that runs throughout the books is the power of storytelling um, and the stories. And you said, you, Felix, in the first book... He's um, remembering the story that his parents told him when they left him in the orphanage um, and that they said to him that they were going, they're booksellers and, and again, there's no big spoilers here, but they said um, they're booksellers, their shop is, is in trouble, so they're going to go around the world and, and find books. And he works, at a certain point, he works out that that was just a story. That wasn't what they were doing. They mm. were leaving him there to be mm. taken care of. And he says, that story saved my life, which is an incredible line, I think. Um, and I guess I wonder, can stories save lives? And is this what these books are trying to do, in a way? Well, I don't want to make any absolute sort of statements about that. Um, I think I'd just prefer to say that stories can give you an enduring and warm feeling that your $20 was well spent. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps I'll leave it at that. But, um, but I wanted these stories to, to be in as organic and real a way, rather than getting into any sort of post-structuralist um, um, sort of abstraction about stories. Because Felix is a storyteller, it's his, mm. it's his capacity for creative thought that, that helps sustain him 
in terms of his feelings about what's happening to him. And, and for me, it was crucially important that Felix not only physically survive this time, mm. that he be one of the lucky very few, but that to the extent that it was credible that, that he enter the rest of his life alive internally as well, capable of giving and accepting love, capable of all of the things that, that we would want any young person to be able to take into their adulthood. Um, so his capacity to tell stories, to keep his enthusiasm, to keep his optimism alive, to tell stories to young Zelda, to not only keep her optimism alive, but help defray some of her fears in as honest a way as he can. These, these were all very important to me because I wanted them to be available to Felix. But I also thought it was a good opportunity to invite young readers to think a little bit about stories because I think um, as somebody who's spent m most of my life inviting young readers to ask certain types of questions about my stories so that they will, I hope, get the most out of them. Um, questions like, who is telling me this story? Um, why are they telling me this story? What does this story really mean? Um, I, I think it's also useful for young people to broaden their view of, of, mm -hmm. of what stories are and where they come from. Um, and those questions are always worth asking of any story. So in, in Felix's um, journey, there's the story that his parents tell him. There's the stories, there are many stories he mm. tells himself. Um, he always believes or hopes they're true, but um, sometimes his optimism pushes, pushes those stories to a level where we can't help but smile because there's something about indomitable optimism <laughs> in the face of what we adults know to be you know, all, too, all too real um, limitations that, 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 that does make us smile. There are many other stories told in these books. The Nazis tell a story to some, Jew some of the Jewish people mm -hmm. about how if they get on these trains, they'll be taken off to the country to work camps where conditions will be much better than they are in the city ghettos, mm -hmm. for example. So Felix, as part of his coming of age, as part of his understanding more about the world, mm -hmm. comes to see that stories, like so much of human activity, fall somewhere, every story falls somewhere on a spectrum from the very best of human intention mm. to the very worst. Stories can, I think, sometimes in certain ways save lives, if not literally and physically, at least metaphorically, but they can also contribute to the taking of lives, mm. both physically and, and the killing of human dimensions internally. I would not for a moment want this discussion, this conversation to turn political, but it is, um, I think, some, well, I, I, I often invite um, young readers, if they want to explore further the presence of stories in our society, mm -hmm. to contemplate that almost all of our communications to each other really take the form of stories, mm -hmm. that politicians are often master storytellers, um, and that the way goods and services are sold in our community often involves the telling of a story. I've had some wonderful discussions with groups of, um, of teenagers where we look at a particular short story that I know all of them know off by heart. It's a story that's been told to us for 10 or 15 years by the Nike Corporation. It's a brilliant short story. If a good story has many layers of subtext, this one has it. It only has three words. <laughs> Just do it. But it's a story that can be retold in many different ways to, um, there's, there's the version that Nike would like us to understand and there are many other versions that um, we don't really have time to go into tonight. <laughs> but um, but it, it's, I think it's, it's, I like the way that the medium that those of us who are storytellers work in has got a very, useful range of practical applications as kind of life skills as well as all of the literary things that 
that stories mm. have to offer. Mm. We'll go to all of your questions in a moment, but um, I might just ask you, is this the last book in Felix's story or do we um, we're going to learn more about it? It's not, no. Um, when I'd written the third book and done the big jump into Felix's 80th year, and it was, well, I assumed, and so did Penguin Books, that <laughs> three books is a trilogy, and that's pretty much, there's a long and honourable literary tradition that that's where you stop. But I noted, when Felix came back and let me know that there was more work to be done, and I was sort of thinking, well, I noted that many before me have, with splendid um, disregard, chosen to redefine a trilogy, and, um, and I currently have a trilogy of five, but I've decided, <laughs> I've decided that seven is the new trilogy. <laughs> so, um, because I've always known that I want to spend one more book with Felix as an elderly man because I want to take him back to where we first met him, to Poland. And I'm not sure exactly why that'll happen, although I've got some, some thoughts, but that will be the final book in this, um, in this group. It'll be called Always. But mm -hmm. over the last year or so, I've become very fascinated with the knowledge that Felix, as a, as a teenager, comes to Australia. Um, he's one of the many people who came from, from Central and other parts of Europe during those years. And even though I'd actually, I didn't think I'd be able to write this book because somewhat carelessly or without understanding its implications fully, in the third book, in Now, the 80-year-old Felix makes a passing mention at some point of the fact that he and his um, adult friend Gabriek they came to Australia a few years, was the phrase I used, <laughs> a few years after the war ended. Well, I don't want him to wait a few years to come to Australia because that would make him 18 or 19, and I want, mm. to, I, I want to write about some things that happen to him when he's 15, maybe even 14 going on 15. Mm. And that means that um, he'll have to come to Australia probably no more than about a year after the war ended. Now, this troubled me for a long time because I thought, well, I can't in all conscience go back and change that book or, you know, I'd, I'd have to go to all the libraries and people's bedrooms. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's, it's just not on. So, but then I thought to myself one day, come on, Morris, get a grip. You're an author, you have an imagination, this is a creative process. And then, of course, I realised that um, the year from when the war ends to when Felix comes to Australia, it's a very, very busy year. We've, we've, <laughs> we've seen this through you know, the first half of it in the book soon, and there's more, to ha more, more will be happening. And I'm pretty certain that by the end of that year, just as he's about to jump on a boat to Australia, <laughs> Felix will have a reflective moment and he'll say to Gabrick, you know, can you believe everything that's happened in this last year? It feels like, it feels more like three or four years <laughs> than one year. I bet, I bet when I'm an old bloke in my 80s and I look back on this period, it will seem to me as though it was three or four years. Now, I prefer you don't mention this to anybody outside of this room, but, uh, but thus liberated by that sleight of hand, I'm now planning to, that the next Felix book I write will be, um, will, will, because... I just think it's so fascinating. Everything I've read and from conversations I've had with people, those people from that, that war-torn continent who came out to Australia in the late 40s and early 50s, um, and of course there are a million different stories, but in general terms, it was the meeting of two groups of people with such different backgrounds and experiences that's always going to be a great background for a story. And there's some stuff that does need to happen in Felix's life, and this is the perfect context for it. I don't yet have a title for that book, so uh, if anybody, when I say that there will be a, a series of seven books that, if read chronologically through Felix's life, will run once, then, after, soon, title, now, always, it might occur to you <laughs> Even in the knowledge that, contract, that complex contractual arrangements mean that I won't actually be able to share any royalties with you if I use your title. <laughs> but if in the, even in that knowledge you feel that you have a one-word title that um, you'd like to whisper to me while I'm signing books, 
um, I think alcohol may well change hands as a result. <laughs> we'll open it up to you guys. Is there a question? I've got one down the front here. Thank you very, very much for a wonderful and optimistically framed description of uh, how Felix uh, endures. I just wanted to reinforce that point because uh, more by way of a comment, my, I'm the son of a Holocaust survivor who in her 80s, when she described her escape, had her stories of the good person, in her case, a good German, but in summing up her life to that point, said after five pages of describing her escape, haven't I lived a charmed life? Yeah, and, and, and this is something that I've been very aware of through this whole process. And in a way it's made the writing of fiction a little harder because one of my um, philosophies of fiction, of writing fiction, is that you avoid coincidence, you avoid good luck at all costs because stories, stories, the, the way the structure serves their purpose, um, they are a contrivance. And we all know that if we see a movie or, or read something where the happy ending is the result of just a good luck coincidence. We feel a little bit cheated in some way. Um, well, I do, anyway. But the simple fact is that the few, the few Jewish people who survived the Holocaust were very lucky. There, there, there were all sorts of other factors in every, each and every individual story. But I certainly, the few precious and, and unforgettable conversations I've had with people who were actually of Felix's generation and who've, who've, who've been prepared to share some of those memories with me, I've never spoken to anybody who hasn't acknowledged that over and above everything else, it, 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 it was a charmed life. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but, but in life, I, I, I might resile from that a bit in fiction or previous to this project I did, but in life I don't think one should because um, it's true and it's, 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 it's worth celebrating um, and even if one chooses not to put it in a religious or, or other context or framework, it still needs to be acknowledged and celebrated and, and, and I think it's probably quite, I mean, I think all of us in much less sort of significant and life-affecting circumstances have thought ourselves lucky. I certainly do in my career. And it's, it's, it, 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 it always feels good to acknowledge it. Another. Um, I really liked all of, um, I really liked the series of your books so far. And I also really liked Boy Overboard. I've been wondering if you're going to write any more books about um, hard experiences with friendship to do with it. Um, this, the fascination I have with friendship in unfriendly times has certainly, um, it's a theme I've explored in other books too. Um, about three years ago, I, uh, um, I wrote a short play, um, which I then turned into a book, um, called Loyal Creatures. It's another story of friendship in wartime. It's, uh, it's about the friendship um, and deep um, relationship that develops between um, a teenage Australian boy and his horse in World War I. And, um, and although, obviously, the parameters of a friendship between a person and an animal are, are different to, to that between two people. Uh, I realized as I was writing it that this friendship to me was as real and significant and um, important um, as the friendship between 
any friendship I'd written between two characters, but different and more fascinating in a way because in a way that, <coughs> that is possible between two human friends where there can be a shared opportunity to choose one's participation. Um, a horse in 1915 who goes off on a boat to a distant war because her owner has volunteered and well, she has no choice. So, so that, that opened up a whole other area of, of interesting um, moral and ethical um, dimensions as well. So I guess, um, I mean, kids some, and teachers sometimes say, so Morris, you know, why, why have you got so serious in your old age? I mean, you used to write books and they were always funny um, with like some serious stuff buried deep inside. And now most of your books have got the serious stuff on their sleeve and you know, there's little moments of humor along the way. Um, and I guess that's true to a certain extent. Um, and I'm not quite sure why that is, but I'm certainly very happy that I'm working in a medium that allows one to sort of drift that far into a slightly different type of story. Although I don't think they're quite as different as, as they might seem at first glance. The covers are very different, but they are still stories, as I said before, where I get to know a character and I find out what is the biggest problem in that character's life. That's, that has remained constant through all my books. Yeah. Hi. Would you have let Zelda live, possibly? I was very distressed when I heard that she died. I'm, no I'm, hearing, I'm hearing your question as a, as a hypothetical <laughs> um, <laughs> inquiry that hypothetically, when I was thinking about the second book, should it have occurred to me, not saying it did, not saying it didn't, should it have occurred to me that because Felix and Zelda were really the ambassadors for the approximately two million Jewish children who were killed by the Nazis, whose survival rate, I don't know what the exact figures are, but I would think that of all the Jewish children alive at the beginning of the war or born during those years, those still alive at the end of the war, it would be a tiny, tiny percentage. So had, I, had it occurred to me that a survival rate of 100% on the part of my two young ambassadors for those children would be indefensible, disrespectful, and plain wrong, had my thinking gone down that path, I would have had a very, very difficult and sad decision to make which is that I already had an inkling at that point that Felix would be appearing in later books, or at least one more, and that really only left one other character who would, should I have thought that, who would be killed by the Nazis. Um, and I can say to you emphatically that had I found myself writing that, it, I'm sure, would have been the most difficult section of a book I'd ever written, and that as I approached it chapter by chapter through the writing of that book, knowing, as I may have done, that that's what I was going to write, <laughs> I would have felt a sense of dread grow inside me, the likes of which I hadn't experienced mm. in the writing of any other book. So, interesting to see how it turns out, it won't it? When, uh, <laughs> When we, when we read that book, um, but <laughs> yeah. I'll oh, have one last question. Um, so at the last book, I'm not really sure how to say it, but maybe you could do maybe Felix's son or grandson later on as a book. Yeah, very good thought. This is what I like. <laughs> <laughs> good. Good, meaty ideas for books I haven't <laughs> written yet that will save me a lot of hard work later on. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. You know, I think it's highly likely that our last encounter with Felix, an elderly man, that 
what it is that takes him back to the very place that we first met him. Without knowing myself exactly what it is, I can say with some confidence that it will be something that has a lot to do with things that have happened previously in his life, both in real physical terms and in emotional and even in thematic and metaphorical terms. So you're on the right track here, absolutely. And um, I'll be coming back to you in a year or two for some more detail of that idea. Sadly, we are out of time. So would you join me in thanking Morris? Thank you.